afternoon, everyone. First item of business today is portfolio questions. And in order to get as many people in as possible, I prefer short and succinct questions and indeed answers to match. Uh, question one, uh, Angus MacLeod. To ask the Scottish Government how they refreshed... sorry. Forgive me. Angus MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government how the Refreshed Infrastructure Investment Plan will, hap will help to tackle climate change. I'm not to Keith Brown. Uh, the Infrastructure Investment Plan 2015 confirms the priority given to tackling climate change and the range of steps being taken across the plan and individual portfolio areas, including health, education and transport, to address climate change. To underline that commitment, energy efficiency has been designated a national infrastructure priority in the plan. Investment in domestic energy efficiency through Scotland's Energy Efficiency Programme helps tackle fuel poverty, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and therefore helps to meet climate change targets and support the economy through providing opportunities for regional SMEs to be involved in the delivery of Scottish Government programmes. Furthermore, by investing in the energy efficiency of our businesses, we will help to ensure that energy costs are affordable for our businesses, helping them to remain competitive on the global stage. And this investment will provide local employment, benefiting local people and communities across Scotland and help grow our low carbon economy. Many thanks, Mr MacDonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. I would be keen to hear his view on the recommendation of the Low Carbon Infrastructure Task Force uh, that in future a much greater proportion of infrastructure expenditure will have to go towards low carbon projects if we are to achieve our, our long-term climate change targets. We have previously welcomed this initiative as providing a valuable contribution to the ongoing challenge of tackling climate change and building a low-carbon economy in Scotland, and we will be interested in the outcomes of the consultation exercise which is now being undertaken. WWF's recognition of the Scottish Government's achievements has been acknowledged in areas like renewables, but we also recognise the need for a comprehensive approach to low-carbon infrastructure, and we continue to develop our understanding of Scotland's long-term infrastructure requirements in this area. So we do recognise that investment in low-carbon infrastructure can help us to deliver not only our climate change targets, but can also make economic sense and drive growth, which is why, as I've said, the latest refresh of the Infrastructure Investment Plan makes energy efficiency a national infrastructure priority, and it commits us to multi-year funding to deliver economic benefits to homes and businesses. We also have plans to highlight other areas of expenditure that support low-carbon projects that help us to achieve our climate change targets. These include low-carbon transport initiatives with investment in cleaner technologies, such as electric vehicles, active travel by encouraging walking and cycling, street lighting replacement programmes, and also for Scotland Schools for the Future programme and NHS boards. We are investing in more energy-efficient school buildings and healthcare facilities, and this will use, help us use more uh, renewable technologies and minimise energy consumption. Many thanks. Question two, Cara Hilton. Uh, point of order, Annabel Goldie. In view of your initial um, injunction to the Chamber, I've noticed the first question and answers took three minutes, Deputy Presiding Officer. How do you propose to ensure that the ten questions listed get into the slot allocated? Many thanks. Um, I appreciate that's not a point of order, but you have nonetheless made a point that was perhaps needing making. Thanks very much. Question two, Cara Hilton. Um, to ask the Scottish Government when the Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure, Investment and Cities last met Fife Council and what issues were discussed? Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. I, I participated in a conference call together with Fife Council and business organisations on the 8th of December to discuss the closure of the Fourth Road Bridge. Uh, thank you. Um, the closure of the fourth bridge um, had a huge detrimental impact on the road uh, network in my constituency and the continuing restrictions on, the, on HGVs um, are placing real strain on the A985 and surrounding roads. The bridge closure demonstrated that both the road and rail networks in West Fife have got trouble coping with prolonged cl closures and it doesn't take much um, imagination to imagine a situation where it could be happening again. So what additional investment will be made to improve the A985 trunk road and to repair the damage caused on roads around West Fife due to the extra HGV traffic. What action will the Scottish Government take to improve rail infrastructure in West Fife and what improvements will the Scottish Government deliver to ensure that we better cope with any future closures and that communities are much better consulted uh, and, and involved in the development That's of travel fine. plans? That's fine. Thank you very much. 
as briefly as you reasonably can. Uh, well, I would concede the point that, of course, the closure of the fourth road bridge had implications for some of the surrounding roads, both trunk roads and local roads, including those in my own constituency, the A977 and others. Uh, we are very pleased that the bridge was opened as quickly as possible to general traffic, if not to HGVs. We are very conscious of the need to open it to HGVs and the programme that we have to try and have the repair done and also pending the uh, assurance that there are no similar kind of uh, issues in terms of the rest of the bridge. We are on track to reopen it to HGVs in uh, the middle of February. Uh, as to the point about any damage, then I would say that if uh, Cara Holden wants to write to me with details of any damage, and of course we're willing to look at that, and we also took action to make sure that those roads which were used as a substitute and are still being used were also free of roadworks during the course of that diversion. So we are willing to take action, and if the member wants to write to me, I'm happy to look at that again. Thanks so much. Question three, Hans Alamalek. Thank you, Manak. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it will revise its winter resilience plan for transport services in light of the disruption in the West Coast mainline service from storm damage. Minister Derek Mackay. The Trunk Road uh, operating companies and Network Rail are responsible for producing and implementing winter resilience plans. Both have taken action in light of the West Coast disruption and will ensure outputs are incorporated into future resilience plans. Thank you. Hans Malik. Uh, thank you very much for that response. The Scottish um, the Scotch Rail announced um, Lance announced on Monday that the uh, um, Lamington Viaduct will be closed for at least uh, one month longer than initially expected due to the discovery of more damage and uh, high water levels hindering repairs. Does the, does the Minister agree with me that winter resilience plan needs to be focused away from only ice and snow and actually look at uh, other areas, particularly uh, high winds and flooding? Uh, can he also assure us that uh, uh, measures will be taken to ensure that we actually get a proper infrastructure protection plan in place because we have had the fiasco of the road, fourth road bridge and now we have got this. Uh, so can he give us assurances that we will actually look at the, 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 the plan more clearly for future? Minister? Well, first of all, I will separate, separate out the issues of the fourth road bridge in terms of that being an unforeseen fault and focus straight uh, on this Lamington uh, viaduct issue, which was caused due to the weather, the volumes of water, what's caused the damage, the scour, as it's known, the severe damage to the structure of the bridge. I'm, I'm very conscious of time. I'm happy to write in full detail to the member about the actions we've taken, the work with network rail mitigation and the engineering works as well to give the, the issue the uh, the attention uh, that it deserves. Happy to share that information with other members as well because of the importance uh, of it. But this was about weather impacting on structure and there are satisfactory measures in place to ensure safety and continuity and inspection and risk assessment when it comes to the infrastructure of our, our country. But of course we will always look further at how we can improve that with transport operators recognising that climate change is a factor that we are increasingly dealing with. Thank you very much. Question four, Fiona McLeod. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether Scottish Canals has any role in flood prevention. Mr Derek Mackay. The Scottish Canals does have a role to play in water management and has canal and reservoir assets which play an active part in flood mitigation. Scottish Canals is represented on the Scottish Government's flooding stakeholder group and is working with partners in the public sector to assist with water resource management and flood control. Thank you very much. Fiona McLeod. Thank you for that answer. I wonder, in light of that answer, Minister, if... Um, given the recent adverse uh, weather conditions, if we will have to update the dredging programme for Scottish canals? Minister? Well, we are deepening the strategy here. <laughs> for the official report, that will be recorded as loud laughter um, <laughs> to, to the Minister's comments. There is a, a serious issue here about uh, the, the use of, of dredging, and that is why Scottish canals is is genuinely strengthening their, their expertise around that, looking at practices and where it uh, can be deployed. So in all seriousness, it is an issue that's been taken forward in terms of the work uh, uh, around there. And I'm happy to give the member more information if required. Many thanks. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, as a follow-up question, could I ask the Minister about how the working structures for flood prevention will take into account the local knowledge of communities, businesses and land managers 
uh, and how that can be made as robust as possible to facilitate information flows both ways in the development of plans. Minister? I'm not one for passing responsibility, but that is more of a matter for uh, my environment colleagues. I'm more than happy to, to share it with uh, Aileen McLeod and, and come back to you in terms of the detail of those structures and uh, community uh, and uh, stakeholder uh, involvement. I cite Scottish Canals as an example of an organisation we're very closely with, and they clearly have a role to play because of the issues around water and uh, use of water, management and flood attenuation schemes and so on. So I'm happy to to pass on that exchange to the appropriate minister. Thank you very much. Um, question five, Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how work in the Aberdeen Western per Peripheral Route is progressing. From the Secretary Keith Brown. The construction work on the AWPR is now well underway and we are on programme to open the road in winter 2017. We will continue to work closely with the contractor to ensure the successful delivery of the project and will also continue to provide regular updates to local communities and to elected representatives. Thank you. Kevin Stewart. Thank you. Um, the Western Peripheral Route is uh, some feat of engineering and construction, a, a vital route for the northeast of Scotland. It will have 75 principal structures, two river crossings, one railway bridge and over 70 culverts. Has the recent adverse weather conditions and flooding had any impacts on the works and is this major project still on schedule? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Kevin Stewart rightly points out the scale of this uh, massive project. Of course, people have been campaigning for this road for uh, the best part of half a century in some cases, and it is a very large project. Uh, and in common with many parts of the North East, again, Kevin Stewart is right to say the recent adverse weather has caused flooding at some locations across the site. It's also right to highlight the fact that major projects, like um, other uh, parts of infrastructure, can be impacted by uh, adverse weather. However, initial signs are that any effects caused by the flooding can be mitigated and absorbed into the programme by rescheduling activities, allowing the project to remain on schedule. This is a fairly standard approach on projects of this nature. Thank you so much. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell us whether progress in the Western Peripheral Route will require uh, any borrowing by the Scottish Government in this financial year or next? Cabinet Secretary. Eight. The Cabinet Secretary has laid it, sorry, the Defence, the, the Deputy First Minister has laid out the nature of the financing for this, which was originally intended to be funded through MPD and, as a member knows, has been reassigned to uh, standard borrowing. So, of course, that has an impact on our budgets, but there's also uh, mitigation being taken in conjunction with the UK Government to ensure that we have cover for all the projects that we want to do. The member will also be aware that there is a, a commitment to around, I think it's £75 million pounds for each of the councils involved. So yes, there is obviously borrowing involved in this project and that's uh, uh, how it's to be financed. Thanks very much. Question six, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its discussions with EU officials regarding funding for public infrastructure projects, including the new Cumberland Academy. Cameron Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, the question is uh, slightly related to the previous question in relation to projects being taken forward, in this case as part of the Hub programme. The Deputy First Minister recently confirmed that the views offered by the Office for National Statistics on proposed changes to the Hub model meant that 10 affected schools and two health centre projects would now be able to proceed to financial close. Uh, the Scottish Futures Trust is working with procuring authorities to achieve that. Uh, the Trust is also working with partners to take forward a longer term hub pipeline, including future projects within Scotland's Schools for the Future programme, to enable them to proceed to financial close in due course. Thank you. Mark Griffin. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. As he pointed out, um, the Deputy First Minister did make a statement to Parliament on the 26th of November to update members on the impact of the Government's infrastructure programme and, give, and did give the indication that um, 12 of the projects would go ahead, 10 schools and two health centres. I was disappointed, though, that Cumberland Academy was not included on in that list. Can the Cabinet Secretary set out today when the pupils and parents in Cumberland will know if they're getting a new school or not? Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, from information I've seen from the Council, I think uh, parents do have that assurance. Uh, the authority themselves have said that they have all the funding available to proceed uh, to, this, uh, to construct this school. On the question of Scottish Government involvement in that, then uh, the member is right to say that's under consideration just now. There is no question it was impacted by the decision of the ONS and also the investigations which the ONS undertook in relation to the Eurostat uh, decision. So that has been considered. I did mention in my original answer the future phase of the uh, 
schools projects which have taken place and uh, the government will make an announcement in due course on the issue of both that school and other schools in that part of the phase, that phase of the programme. Many thanks. Question seven, Siobhan McMahon. To ask the Scottish Government when the Scottish Water report into the contamination incident in North Lanarkshire in June 2015 that affected 6,000 households will be published. And the Secretary Keith Brown. The Scottish Water Report has been submitted to the Drinking Water Quality Regulator as part of her investigations into this incident. Uh, until her investigations are complete and any ne necessary legal action which might uh, arise has been taken, it would not be appropriate to release this report. Many thanks. Siobhan McMahon. It's my understanding, as, as the Cabinet Secretary said, that the Drinking Water Regulator for Scotland is investigating the circumstances of the incident. Um, and that Scottish Water's reports formed part of that investigation, which may result in the regulator making a report to the Procurator Fiscal. Given it is now over six months since the contamination incident that has affected many constituents, they are still unaware of the cause of contamination. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide an assurance that the report in question shall be made public, publicly available when she has committed to that work, given that those 6,000 households are still left without any answers to what happened in June 2015? Yeah, I appreciate what the member says about her constituents wanting to get answers uh, to this and uh, it's for that reason that it has been treated uh, very seriously. Of course, the drinking water quality regulator, the office was set up some, I think, 14 years ago um, and it's independent from the government. So we have to await that process. And of course, more information will come out when either the drinking wa water quality regulator provides her report or, as I said, if legal action is taken, it will come into the public uh, uh, domain at that time. What I would undertake to do is, as soon as these strictures which apply uh, no longer apply, then I'm happy to give as much information as I am legally able to give to both the member and her constituents to update them on the circumstances. Many thanks. Question 8, John Wilson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government when it last met Scottish Water. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, I last met Scottish Water on the 17th of December 2015 when I announced a £120 million investment to improve the resilience of water supplies in Ayrshire. My officials, of course, as you would expect, are in daily contact with Scottish Water on a wide range of matters. Thank you. John Wilson. I thank the, Minister, the Cabinet Secretary for his response. I am aware that Scottish Water routinely carries out water quality testing of household water supplies. Could I ask the Cabinet Secretary if he is aware of any issues which prevent Scottish Water from providing the test results to the householder? And if there are no issues arising from that, could he advise Scottish Water to routinely ensure that householders receive a copy of the results of the test is carried out? Sorry, carried out? Hey, I'm aware, uh, not least in relation to the answer I've just given to Siobhan McMahon, that there may be circumstances in which the other strictures apply which would not allow that information to be passed out in the way that John Wilson said. Beyond that, I'm not sure there is any reason why the information can't be provided. So, uh, in relation to the question that John Wilson's uh, asked, I'm happy to investigate that with Scottish Water and come back to him with the outcome of those uh, discussions. Many thanks. Question nine, Annabel Goldie. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to maximise the economic growth potential and investment opportunities made possible by funding from the UK City Deals programme. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, the Scottish Government has been consistently clear that it views cities and their regions as the key engines of the Scottish economy. We are, are therefore committed to working with all of our cities to stimulate growth and deliver infrastructure investment. We are making significant investments across Scotland and are working with the UK Government to ensure that any funding proposals add to the work that we are already doing with our cities. Thank you. Annabel Goldie. Of existing city deals in England have involved agreements with central government and devolution of powers over areas like schools and transport. So, what measures have the Scottish Government taken to deliver more local powers and city deal areas in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I would say that the nature of city deals, both uh, in Scotland, we've had one, and of course others are being discussed at this time, uh, and also the nature of city deals uh, in England and in Wales, a very uh, large one recently in Cardiff, has changed over the period. So some of those have involved asks for additional powers, as the member uh, mentions, and some councils have talked about additional powers, for example, in relation to um, things like uh, employment uh, uh, services, which are provided by, currently by the Scottish Government. So there is an ask that's there. It's not been uh, detailed as yet. Most of the city deals that we've advanced along with the UK Government uh, have been talking about infrastructure projects 
uh, some other innovations as well, which we will obviously talk about as soon as those city deals are completed. So we are willing to respond to requests from local government to talk about these additional powers, but it has to be made uh, specific. And uh, the final judgment will be to say whether the powers asked for, if devolved, further devolved, uh, and some of them that have been asked to be devolved, we don't even have at this point in time, if that would add to the uh, value of the city deal that's under consideration. So we remain open-minded to these suggestions, uh, and we'll take that forward as and when the case is made to us. Alison McInnes, briefly, please. Thank you. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the need for regional investment in Aberdeen is even more pressing now than when the city deal was first proposed? And will he give an assurance that securing and financially supporting the Aberdeen city deal is a key priority of his government? Absolutely. I think that's a very good point, and we've had very recent discussions. I discussed this with the UK Government uh, Minister responsible about 10 days ago. There's been subsequent discussions since then. I well understand the urgency of the situation in the North East and in Aberdeen, uh, and we are taking that forward along with our partners. I met both with the leader of Aberdeen Council and Aberdeenshire Council and with the UK Government. So I think both the Scottish Government and the UK Government understand the urgency and the gravity of the situation. Many thanks, and that concludes that portfolio. We now move to portfolio questions on culture, Europe and external affairs. Uh, question one has been allocated to Mr Mark MacDonald. And Mr MacDonald, if you would like to ask your question now, please do. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to improve cultural opportunities for people from deprived areas. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, the Scottish Government is committed to supporting programmes that ensure that background is not a barrier and giving people from all walks of life a chance to participate in and enjoy the arts. For instance, in 1617, we are providing the national collections with over £46 million in running cost budgets so that the commitment to free access is maintained. Uh, we support a number of programmes for children and young people. Um, £10 million is being invested in the Youth Music Initiative, and that provided um, music opportunities for over 225,000 children across all 32 local authorities in 2014-15, meaning children from deprived areas that have music-making opportunities. And from September 2015 to uh, April 2016, the National Theatre of Scotland is working with Aberdeen City Council through the Granite Production, uh, bringing a programme of performances, interactive installations and events to the city streets. This also includes the NTS and the Aberdeen Performing Arts Youth Theatre, making several, um, working with several community groups across the city to make a large-scale production that will take place within the quadrangle of Marshall College. Thanks. Just remind the Chamber again, short questions and answers will be appreciated. Mark MacDonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that comprehensive answer. Can she uh, advise further what steps are being taken to encourage uh, both local and national creative organisations to perform more outreach work into communities, particularly communities of deprivation, where individuals often face barriers to travelling into central locations to access cultural opportunities, and which might enable uh, cultural activity within, to take place within communities, giving more of a sense of place? Uh, well, Creative Scotland, who is uh, our lead organisation in this area, um, is building on what was a fantastic 2014 cultural programme. It saw over 12,000 events in all 32 local authorities, with 2.1 million visitors all over different parts of, of Scotland. I think the member is right to identify the, the need to actually have performances and productions working with communities and in communities. And they are taking, uh, currently, Creative Scotland are looking um, to review their qualities, diversity, and inclusion activity to make sure that all communities are able to access and participate in the arts and I would direct Creative Scotland to the members' interest. Many thanks. Question two, Mike McKenzie. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the UK Government's decision to rule out a return to the post-study work visa. Minister Rumza Yousaf. The Scottish Government was deeply disappointed by the UK Government's statement which ruled out the return of the post-study work visa in Scotland. The statement ignored the consensus that exists among Scottish businesses, education and indeed every political party represented in this chamber, uh, that there is a clear need for the return of the post-study work visa. It also, in our opinion, went clearly against the spirit uh, of the Smith Commission recommendations. Many thanks. Uh, Mike McKenzie. Thank the Minister for that answer. I wonder if we could outline what discussions were held with Scottish stakeholders on this decision, given that the call to return the visa has been backed by businesses, colleges, universities, and as he's just mentioned, has cross-party support in this parliament. Uh, Minister? Uh, lots of uh, engagement is taking place with stakeholders uh, up and down the country and uh, uh, representing a multitude of stakeholders. Most recently, at the end of the year, we held a workshop 
with over 30 representatives from across uh, academia, from across business, from across trade union representatives and indeed representatives of other political parties and all of them uh, united in the consensus for the return of the post-study work visa. It would be worth saying that since the written statement by the Secretary of State for Scotland, he has sought to distance himself uh, from his own statement uh, and his appearance at the Scottish Affairs Select Committee yesterday uh, and did indicate that if sensible proposals well, were put forward, the UK Government would consider them. So we look forward to having that discussion with the UK Government, with meeting the UK Immigration Minister, who has agreed to meet with the Cross-Party Post-Study Work Steering Group, and hopefully take this issue uh, further forward. Many thanks. Uh, question three, Linda Fabiani. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how it ensures that people with additional support needs can access or participate in cultural activities. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. In 2015, Creative Scotland began a three-year programme of regular support worth £100 million to 118 organisations, including those who provide specific opportunities for people with additional support needs to take part in the arts. And this includes Drake Music Scotland, which is receiving £350,000 to provide opportunities for people with disabilities to play, learn and compose music through specialist teaching methods and music technology. Other organisations supported include, include uh, £450,000 for Birds of Paradise Theatre Company, £600,000 for Solar Bear and £300,000 for Paragon Ensemble. In addition to relaxed performances designed to enable those with additional support needs to enjoy the arts in a venue setting, the national performing companies have developed programmes to engage directly with special schools whose children have additional support needs. Thanks. Uh, Linda Fabiani. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and ask if she agrees with me how important it is at a local level the arts and culture uh, are there to promote participation, confidence, joy and well-being amongst those with special needs. And will she join me in uh, celebrating organisations like Chaotic Productions, who in East Kilbride work very hard with adults uh, with special needs to enable them to perform for the benefit of the town as a whole and perhaps consider joining me at some point at one of their wonderful performances. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much for the, for the uh, invitation. Uh, drama, production, culture can be hugely empowering for um, all of us, but particularly um, those with additional support needs, I think, can make a real difference to their lives and the quality of their lives and the joy of, of their lives. So uh, I think it's very important, not just at the national level, but also at the local level, and that that is supported, and I'd be delighted to take up our invitation should the opportunity arise. Excellent. Uh, question four, Tavi Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assistance it is providing to refugees from Syria and what further discussions it has had with the United Kingdom Government on this matter. Uh, Minister Humza Yousaf. Uh, the Refugee Task Force, established by the First Minister in September 2015, brings together Scottish Ministers, COSLA, Scottish Refugee Council, the UK Government, uh, local government and other stakeholders to coordinate Scotland's humanitarian and very practical response to the refugee crisis. The task force has ensured uh, that refugees have received the warmest uh, welcome to Scotland and continues to work uh, to support the delivery of arrangements to help refugees settle into the new homes and communities and the work of integration, which will take not just days, weeks, but indeed as, a, as a, a, an, an effort that will take a number of years. The Scottish Government is in regular dialogue with the UK Government about arrangements on the arrival of Syrian refugees in Scotland, and I spoke to the Home Office about this uh, just last week. Many thanks. Tavis Scott. Thank the Minister for the sentiment of his answer. I wonder if he shares with me um, the concerns that uh, pupils from the 8th Junior High School in Shetland expressed to me last week, that this has fallen off the news agenda. We do not see the plight of uh, Syrian refugees, particularly in wintertime, uh, at this time being covered by uh, national, indeed international, television and other news outlets. Uh, would, he also share, uh, or would he also agree with me that uh, the concern of pupils of that age is that the moral imperative to act is still with us? Uh, what uh, further proposals might he have in that regard? And would he also consider that the comments of the Foreign Secretary this morning on Radio Scotland are very much at odds with how many of us feel in Scotland today? No, I haven't seen those remarks yet, but I, I will make sure that, that I do. But I uh, agree entirely with what Tavish Scott says and his con constituency in Shetland, that uh, there is a danger at this issue after those disturbing Im images that we saw in the summertime are off our television screen, that the, uh, the, the issue itself uh, comes off people's radars. Uh, I think there's a hell of a lot more that the UK government and Scottish government and local authorities can do. That 20,000 that's been announced by the UK government, we think, should absolutely only be a floor, not a ceiling. Uh, a number of organisations like Save the Children who have raised the issue of unaccompanied children. In fact, uh, Tim Farron, uh, as leader at the UK level, has uh, broached this issue, I know, with the Prime Minister 
and the Foreign Secretary, and certainly a call also that the Scottish Government uh, would support as well. But I would say, on a perhaps more positive note, that it has been incredible the response from all 32 local authorities expressing their willingness to want to get involved. And we have to sure, ensure as the Scottish Government that we harness that public attitude, that public uh, desire to want to help the most vulnerable in the world. Okay, thanks. Jamie McGregor. Um, uh, does the Minister agree with me that we should be proud of the UK's efforts to help the most vulnerable refugees from Syria that are unable to leave the re region, including providing over 19 million food rations and having allocated 1.2 billion in aid? Minister? Uh, yes, I, I do. I, mean, I, I commend uh, the efforts that the UK Government has made as one of the largest donors uh, in that region, uh, also for the efforts that it's making in terms of the Syrian uh, VPR scheme. I would say that we have had some differences. We do believe that the UK Government should opt into the EU resettlement and relocation scheme for those refugees that are arriving across the Aegean Sea. Uh, and we also think that we can take more refugees, and perhaps, as I've already mentioned in the answer before, we should consider unaccompanied children. But that's not to discredit anything the UK Government is doing. I think it should be applauded uh, for the efforts that it's made in the region, and we stand ready as a Scottish Government to assist where we can. Many thanks. Question five, Ken McIntosh. To ask the Scottish Government what support it will provide to local museums and galleries following a reduction in the culture budget for 2016-17. Uh, the Scottish Government primarily supports local museums and galleries through funding to Museums Galleries Scotland. Uh, funding for mining, maritime and fisheries industrial museums directly from the Scottish Government has not been reduced. And although overall funding for Museum Galleries Scotland has, on the revenue side, been reduced by £110,000, I have made an available an additional £200,000 of capital, trebling the amount of capital available. There is therefore an overall increase of £90,000 of funding support for local museums and galleries from the Scottish Government culture budget, and I hope you will support that. Many thanks. Ken McIntosh. Thank you, President Officer. Can I thank the Minister for her answer? I'm sure the Minister will, be, will share my concern about the existing inequitable access to our local museums and galleries, to Scotland's museums and galleries, uh, and the importance of ensuring that all our uh, public policy decisions and public finance decisions improve enjoyment of the arts amongst our disadvantaged communities and do not compound that disadvantage. Can I ask the Minister how she intends to assess and monitor the impact of her cut, along with the £500 million cut that she is making on our local authority budgets, given that this is highly likely to impact uh, mostly on the non-statutory services, such as local museums and galleries? Uh, can I challenge the premise of the... The member's question, he obviously didn't listen to my answer. There has been no cut from the culture budget for local museums and galleries. That's a very important protection from the Scottish uh, Government, and it's one that I think uh, you know, we will continue to support. In addition, this Government took on direct funding of the mining, uh, maritime and fisheries and uh, industrial museums, and again, uh, in terms of our budget, there is no reduction. So I think it's very important that when members come to this chamber, they actually listen to the answers to make it quite clear that we are protecting that. In terms, therefore, of what uh, uh, other local authorities might do, uh, I, I think it's very important that the arts and culture budget are protected in terms of uh, what local authorities can do, and they have done that up till now. I have confidence and faith that we'll make the right decisions, as the Scottish Government done. We're leading by example. Thanks, Sarah Boyer. <coughs> Thank you. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary a supplementary on that particular issue and ask her if she is um, in discussion with the Deputy First Minister about the issue of whether a tourism levy would assist local authorities to um, take pressure off their budgets but also enable them to invest more in local culture, which is obviously an issue that is under huge pressure in local authorities across the country. Uh, I'm aware that uh, Edinburgh uh, City Region has proposed such a, uh, a measure. It's up for them to argue that, but I, I do understand that across government there are different interests, whether it's the tourism minister, whether it's the finance minister, or indeed uh, with Keith Brown, who is the lead on the city deal. But it's something that I will keep close interest in. Many thanks. Uh, question six, Joanne Lambert. <coughs> Try a different console. Shout. 
Press your request to speak button. Yeah. Just shout. Go for it. Use mine. My apologies. To ask the Scottish Government when the Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Europe and External Affairs last met Glasgow City Council. Okay. I last met with Glasgow City Council on the 17th of November at the launch of the Royal Scottish National Orchestra's new world-class facility at the Glasgow Royal Concert Hall, uh, for which the Scottish Government has provided £9.2 million of funding. Thank you very much. Joanne Lamont. I'm sure the, the Cabinet Secretary shares with me a great pride in the work done by Glasgow City Council and local communities to uh, contribute to the arts and to culture over many years. Has the Cabinet Secretary made an, uh, an assessment of the impact of the cuts of her government to local government, and particularly to Glasgow, which have disproportionately been affected by these, um, the impact of that on Glasgow's proud heritage and its culture? And will she make representation to the Finance Secretary to think again about the way in which Glasgow has been funded? Secretary. Uh, well, in, in terms of the reduction of um, uh, local government funding, it's to the degree of 2%. Actually, my budget has received a far greater reduction than, than Glasgow City Council. And in terms of the management of my budget, as I have said in my previous answer, it has been possible for uh, the culture portfolio to protect funding for local museums and galleries. I'm not sure if she was in the chamber to hear um, my, my previous answer. Uh, yes, there are challenges, but in terms of budgeting, if we are having to uh, live under uh, the current Westminster government, a Tory government that is implementing austerity budgets that she wanted to maintain by her position in the referendum, I think it's very difficult to come to this chamber and say after the event, oh, we don't like the Tory government's uh, budgets and its implications for Scotland. This is very hard and in a challenging budget, a 2% reduction compared to other portfolios is actually a better position than many of us are finding ourselves. Many thanks. Uh, question 7, Claudia Beamish. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to recognise the contribution of David Bowie made to the cultural life of Scotland and beyond. Uh, the Scottish Government has no current plans to recognise the cultural contribution of David Barry, although we are aware that there are numerous connections to Scotland. Uh, as a great artist, David Barry sought to challenge and change perceptions and made great music, drama and visual arts. His influence in changing the worlds of the LGBT uh, community was enormous. Uh, an icon of the modern world, one of the most immediate responses which captured that combined sense of loss and appreciation was the organist at the Kelvin Grove uh, Museum playing Life on Mars, which was seen by millions on the internet. Thanks. Claudia Beamish. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Not just because I was a fan of his since the first Glastonbury gig where he sang Turn and Face the Strange Changes. It seems to me that David Bowie symbolised and still does a visionary approach to life uh, which inspired so many across generations and helped give confidence to those who were afraid of change and opened up opportunities to explore our own identities and have the courage to constantly reinvent ourselves. So I appreciate the recognition in the chamber uh, given is... to him. And uh, my question is just, could we confer possibly Cabinet Secretary to think about the future in those terms? <laughs> well, I'm not sure if Claudia Beamish was ever a rebel rebel or uh, uh, otherwise, but in terms of... Uh, <laughs> but in, in terms of the most serious point about how we see ourselves, we live now in a modern world which has been shaped by those who are prepared to challenge artists, great artists, challenge how we see ourselves and what we think. And that is why I will always, um, in my passion for arts and culture, uh, you know, have that opportunity to recognise those artists, uh, th those that are perhaps inspired by Barry, but indeed others, who seek to change how we think. And I think perhaps in this place, of all places, presiding officer, sometimes we should be challenged how we think and to think and be visionary about how we deal with it and have tolerance and respect and understanding. Okay, thanks. Question eight, John McAlpine. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government when the Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Europe and External Affairs will next visit Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I have no engagements in Dumfries and Galloway in the near future. 
Joanne, Mc Joanne McAlpine. Um, I was recently uh, privileged to speak at the reopening of the Theatre Royal, Scotland's oldest working theatre, um, which was refurbished um, by a number of partners, including Creative Scotland. Uh, given that the theatre has got a strong association with both Burns and Barry and has an excellent youth programme, um, can I recommend that the next time the Culture Secretary uh, visits Dumfries and Galloway, it would be well worth her dropping in? I'd be, I'd be very pleased to do so if the opportunity uh, arises. I did visit the uh, Dumfries Theatre Royal in April 2013 at the start of, of the developments, and I'd be very keen to see the progress. Hey, thanks. And question nine, Rod Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether the Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Europe and External Affairs considers that the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights is of benefit to Scotland. Uh, Minister Hamza Yusuf. Yes, EU Charter protects important fundamental rights in areas ranging from civil liberties to consumer protection. It has uh, effect in the specific context of EU law. Uh, the Scottish Government strongly supports uh, the EU Charter. Rod Campbell. I thank the Minister for that answer. Um, we obviously await the UK Government's proposals on a British Bill of Rights, but does the Minister agree that short of a UK withdrawal from the European Union, the Charter of Fundamental Rights will apply throughout the UK when matters of EU law are engaged, and that any proposals to be made by the UK Government need to take this and the benefits of the Charter fully into account? Minister. Uh, yes, I entirely uh, agree. The safeguards contained in the EU Charter would continue to apply for as long as the UK remembers, uh, remains a, a member of the EU. Uh, this would be the case irrespective of what emerges from the UK Government's uh, promised consultation on a British Bill of Rights. Uh, repeal of the Human Rights Act would not alter the requirement to comply with EU law or the Charter. It would be of grave concern uh, if the UK Government looked to use uh, the Charter as, a, uh, as part of the renegotiation. Uh, we would have uh, strongly opposed that, as we have strongly opposed uh, uh, any, any uh, dilution of human rights uh, in UK legislation uh, as well. Many thanks. And that concludes portfolio questions. And we now move to the next item of business, which is a